Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's UCLA Alumni Town Hall on campus updates and renovations hosted by UCLA Alumni Board of Directors, Steve Yu. My name is Joseph Blancas and I serve as an Associate Director at the UCLA Alumni Association. The UCLA Alumni Town Hall series is a gathering place where Bruins can have their voices heard, ask essential questions, and receive transparency and expertise. Today's program will provide insights into the exciting improvements and renovations taking place around campus, including the new campus acquisitions in Rancho Palos Verdes, as well as downtown Los Angeles. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank our Alumni Association sustaining donors. It's with your help that we are able to strengthen the Bruin community with programs like this. For some general webinar housekeeping, we will have time at the end of our program for a Q&A with our speaker. So please email your questions to the email provided in the chat. We will also be recording the event and we'll share it out once it's available. Now to start our program, I'm excited to introduce our moderator for today. Steve Yu is the Chief Operating and Financial Officer at the new UCLA South Bay campus and previously served as the Chief Financial Officer and Assistant Dean at the UCLA Law School. He received both his bachelor's degree and MBA from UCLA. He is a current board member of the UCLA Alumni Association and the current president-elect of the UCLA Anderson Alumni Association. Steve, thank you for being here and moderating today's conversation with Peter. Thank, thanks, Joseph. I'm excited about this, this talk and this topic. So thanks for having me. Of course. And I'd also like to welcome and introduce today's guest, Peter Hendrickson, the Associate Vice Chancellor for Design and Construction for UCLA Capital Programs. Peter is a licensed architect with over 30 years of experience in the practice of architecture, facilities, facilities planning, design, and construction. In his role, he is responsible for managing the design and construction of the approximately 2 billion capital improvement programs for the campus. Prior to joining UCLA, Peter served as the Director of Facilities Planning, Design and Construction at Cedar sinai Health Systems and as the Chief of Facilities Planning for the Los Angeles County Department of Health Services. Peter, thank you also for being here with us tonight. We're excited to have you. And Steve, I'll turn it over to you to start our program. Okay, great. Hey, Peter, good to see you. Uh, you know, especially I've been in my new role for about five weeks now, and we already have a ton of business together. So it's it's fun to be able to do this together. And, you know, I understand you have a, a slide deck for us that goes into the history of UCLA and, and what Capital Programs does and, and is, is doing going into the future. So can you tee us off and give us a little tutorial and education here? Sure. And again, it's to understand kind of, um, you know, the future of UCLA. It's really good to start to see where, where we've been in the history. So with that, I'll start sharing um, the presentation. Um, one, one thing I want to mention before we start is the two um, links below, and, and you'll um, see this at the end of the presentation. But if you're interested in the capital program, you could um, go to the uh, University uh, of California Office of the President website, you can see the capital program for both UCLA as well as all the other campuses. And you can also go to the capital programs website, which is a good resource to see what's happening on campus. So with that, again, let's start even before the beginning of UCLA. So um, the, the original uh, normal school uh, which was established in 1882 in Los Angeles was a teacher's college. Um, and it, when I mentioned 1882, it was actually established prior to uh, the University of California, which is Berkeley, at Berkeley, the only, the only campus at that time. Um, Southern California was going through a large transition in, um, at the turn of the century, the 20th century, there's only about 120,000 uh, people in Southern California. Um, there's almost double the amount of people up in the Bay Area, but that rapidly changed. Um, in the next 20 years, um, the uh, population of Southern California grew um, to about uh, 500,000 
in um, in 1920 and about 1.2 million in 1929. So there was a rapid growth. So the, the normal school was a, a place where teachers uh, were educated. The location is at the site of the current um, LA Public Library in downtown Los Angeles. So this um, school resided there from 1882 to 1914 when it needed larger quarters. So um, in 1914, it moved uh, to the, what we call the Vermont campus. Um, that's Vermont and Heliotrope in the Hollywood area. Um, while the, the uh, normal school was at the Vermont campus uh, in 1919, um, the Southern branch of the University of California uh, was established at this site. Um, one thing you can notice very clearly is that um, there was a lot of development around um, the campus. So almost immediately it was understood that this couldn't be a long-term uh, location uh, for the Southern Branch. So almost immediately after the establishment of the Southern Branch of the University of California, there was a search that was um, started to look for an alternate site. So what's interesting is um, there were 17 submittals or proposals uh, to the regents to locate the campus. There's three finalists. Uh, one was actually in uh, the Palos Verdes Peninsula. There's a thousand acres that was proposed for a university. There was also a site in Pasadena that was um, identified. And then there was a site which was called the Beverly site, which was in Westwood. And it was um, on a, a Jans uh, Development Corporation uh, property. Uh, so uh, the story goes that there's two um, individuals that were really responsible in the development of the selection in the campus um, in Southern California. One, his name is George uh, Kellum. He was a supervising architect for the University of California. And then also Herbert Foster, who is a university engineer. Um, when the selection process started, um, the, there was a, a committee of the regents that were identified um, to tour um, the different sites to make a final selection. Well, um, George and Herbert had their idea that you know the Beverly site was the perfect site for the university. So when they um, picked up the, the uh, delegates to go down to each um, of the campuses, they chose to, to visit the Palos Verde sites uh, in the early morning. And, and as they drove down, they had the windows open. So it was very uncomfortable for um, these uh, the selection committee to drive down. And then, and then when they arrived, it was foggy. So they looked at the property and you know they thought, okay, this is first site. So um, they chose to go to Pasadena uh, for the second site. So they arrived in Pasadena right in the early afternoon and, and it was very hot. And, um, and they made it even hotter because they kept the windows rolled up as they brought these, um, these committee members to Pasadena. So they saw the site and it was very uncomfortable. But then when they arrived at the Westwood site, it was kind of late afternoon. The, the ocean breezes were coming in and they were on the kind of the hill looking over. And at the time you could see, you know, um, the, the ocean. It was just a very wonderful site. So um, the committee members ultimately selected Westwood as the site for the new campus. So, um, George uh, Kellum got to, um, busy developing kind of a master plan for the new campus, the new Southern Branch. Again, but at the time of the establishment of the campus, uh, it was called the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, so these different kind of Beaux-Arts master plans, very suburban plans that were developed um, because ultimately you could, um, you know, start seeing, you could see in the, the left, lower left, basically the outline and, and how basically undeveloped the area was. Um, so the plans were starting to be developed. Uh, also, Herbert Foster was busy um, kind of um, surveying the location of the new 
campus and you know working with the Jones Corporation as you can see there wasn't a lot of major you know um, uh, roads in the area so he just put placeholders in um, around the, the roads around the campus one uh, you know uh, he thought he was going to just assign um, his old professors from UC Berkeley so he, he chose um, Joseph Lacan as one of his professors of geology and natural history, Eugene Hilgard, who was another professor of his up at Berkeley, and then Charles Gailey, who is a, another professor, an English professor. So he wrote the names down and he thought nothing of it. He thought the Jans Corporation was gonna change the names. Well, obviously they never did. So, so that's, that's how um, some of the, the roadways that bound the campus actually were established. So you could see some um, pictures again up. They could see Founders Rock, which was one of the first installations on the campus. You could see the Arroyo Bridge starting to be developed. And then you could see um, both Powell and then Royce Hall um, starting to be developed on campus. So the first, you know, the first buildings you could see there again, there was there's a lot of open land around the area. Actually, the University of California was criticized because they, um, you know, they, the, you know, people in Los Angeles were saying, look, you know, the only, you know, um, neighbors the students are going to have are uh, farmers. You know, they're so out in the, you know, so far out in the country and you know, nobody's ever going to, you know, be around them. Well, I guess they were mistaken as Los Angeles grew around them. And you could also see in this, in the picture on the left, um, you can see jam steps. You can start seeing that it basically led right down to a parking lot. And so, you know, even in the earliest days, you know, UCLA was a commuter campus. Um, so the, the image on the right, the picture on the right, basically just shows that up until um, the late 30s, um, UCLA was kind of being, um, you know, designed by by the master plan it was it was hearing adhering pretty closely to the master plan and um you know again a very suburban area you could see the development starting to you know um, basically encroach upon the campus but again still a very suburban campus then um world war ii happened and um there was a, a basically just a, a major growth period after after the Second World War. In 1945, Walton Beckett, a, a very uh, noted uh, mid-century architect, was named master planner and chief architect of the University of California. Also in 1948, the uh, medical school was established and the first medical director of the school uh, was Stafford Warren. His previous position was the medical director of the Manhattan Project. So he was very uh, well, um, you know, his, his goal and his vision of the medical school was to have a very interdisciplinary um, uh, um, program that had both clinical um, services as well as research services. So at a very early stage, um, you know, the Center for Health Sciences actually was kind of the cutting edge of the 50s. And I love this, you know, alumni magazine from, um, you know, 1951, where they were talking about, you know, the, the CHS was going to be the first uh, medical center of the atomic age. So um, again, there's just a, UCLA has always been on the cutting edge of, of research and science. Um, you can see on the first uh, graduates from the medical schools in 1955. Um, you could see that the Center for Health Sciences, which was a very interesting um, uh, complex, it was developed with what was called the Lorraine Cross, which is basically you could, you know, you could continually add wings to this and create courtyards. And it, it basically was being built from about 1955 until about 1978. So again, a, a very uh, active time on the campus. Um, you could see the shot from 1952. Um, that suburban campus is no longer, um, you know, a, 
it was no longer going to the master plan of the original George Kellum master plan. But um, basically the, the campus was being consumed by surface parking. It was basically buildings surrounded by surface parking. Um, a lot of this had to do with just uh, attempting to um, grow or, or grow the enrollment on the campus, keep up with a lot of the returning GIs coming in and um, getting higher, you know, requiring higher education. So uh, the 50s, you know, basically this continued. You could start seeing the campus in the 60s. Um, there was, you know, the currently we're at 419 acres. Um, the original campus was actually uh, 35.5 acres less uh, because what we call now the Southwest Campus wasn't deeded um, to the University of California until the early 60s. And that, again, that's what created our, our Southwest Campus. In the 70s, um, some significant events that influenced the growth. One was the Silmar earthquake in 1971. Um, this basically as if some of you recall um was a, a seminal event in california because there was a brand new um, county hospital um, all of you hospital just opened its doors and in the somar earthquake it basically collapsed so that what that's what created what's called the office of statewide health planning and development all of the acute care hospitals went under their jurisdiction and it really changed the whole way hospital design um, was uh, developed from that point on. Also, um, a significant event in 1970, uh, was 1978, when Proposition 13 was passed by the uh, voters of California, which basically eliminated a lot of the support for publicly funded um, institutions like uh, universities. Um, so from 78, until what happened in the early 80s. Um, it was a very quiet period for UCLA as far as the capital program. Again, there is still um, a lot of the, uh, the University of California is trying to find uh, what other resources are there that could support the public land grant institution. A couple of events actually helped immensely. One uh, was uh, the Summer Olympics in 1984. Uh, many of you may know that you know that the residence halls um, on campus up through the 70s there was very few um, beds on campus again it was it was basically a commuter campus uh, but what allowed um, the summer olympics basically to use the four uh, original residence halls in addition to adding hitch and saxon uh, the suites that were up in the Northwest campus. But it created an, a, a, a lot of kind of energy in regards to preparing for the Olympics. And it, it again, jump-started the, the capital program again. And then another, um, you know, as a result of, of the Silmar quake, um, there was a lot of legislation that was slowly making its way. And then finally in 1987, the uh, initial seismic correction program at UCLA was established. Another seminal event, uh, it was in January um, of 1994, the Northridge earthquake. Um, again, many of you may uh, recall seeing some of the pictures and some of them right here of Royce Hall. It was one of the towers almost came down. How Library was actually um, under construction to do seismic mitigation and the whole ceiling of the reading room collapsed um, into onto the floor. Um, some significant major damage all across the campus. The Center for Health Sciences sustained some significant damage. And again, for many years after that, that this was really um, what propelled um, the capital program in, 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 in seismic mitigation. And that's where we focused um, many years uh, with that. So just some examples of what um, this, you know, after subsequent to the Northridge earthquake, um, this picture of PAL was uh, prior to the Northridge earthquake. And you could see there was a, a very um, 
kind of low cost addition uh, for the book stacks in uh, Powell Library. What the, after the Northridge earthquake, the funding that was made available, um, there was some opportunity to kind of, you know, uh, improve situation. So there was an ability to kind of replan uh, Powell Library to include the stacks internal and, and basically create, um, you know, more appropriate structure to these these wonderful historic buildings. Um, also, one of the major um, activities that was really looked at in kind of strategic planning on the university was really to try and create more of a campus and not have a sea of parking, surface parking around the campus. So there's a huge effort made to start to pull a lot of the parking underground and, and enable us to create these, these green spaces around the campus. So there, the, during the late 90s and the early 2000s, there's a, a huge effort to um, develop uh, the campus in, a, in a, uh, an appropriate manner to really create some beautiful spaces in between the buildings. You can also see, again, you take, spend a lot of time looking at, you know, how do we improve and how do we improve the areas between the campuses? So that's, again, this is where the intramural field came into play where we have underground parking and then the um, play fields above. Um, we also uh, came up with a strategy of what we called um, laminate buildings. So, Again, is trying to, if we have parking structures, you know, try and create some interest at the edges of the parking structure. So, or, or some, you know, modern buildings that they're in view quarters and you can create some more uh, appropriate context to, you know, understanding that you're on campus and you're using all the building materials um, that is traditional to UCLA and different, different areas of campus. Um, just to um, give you a sense of, you know, where UCLA is today, again, the campus, as I mentioned, is 419 acres, is southern, um, southwest uh, piece of the campus, which was, um, you know, basically acquired by the university in the 60s, it was about 35.5 acres to, you know, include the total campus of 419 acres. It's about 20 5 million square feet on campus. We're, we are the smallest land campus in the system. We're the densest campus in the system. We also have the largest um, student population um, over uh, 40, uh, 46, I think now it's 48,000 students. Um, so, you know, giving you that background, you know, and just what, what does capital programs, what, what is our mission? And one is really to support um, priorities and support the instruction and research mission of the university. We um, have planning staff, environmental staff, um, we have architects, engineers, and project managers and construction managers. And we basically manage uh, the entire program um, from looking at land uses, establish, you know, the physical design framework. We have to abide by all the university policy and procedures, environmental, regulatory requirements, and, and community interests. So what do we manage? Well, we manage what's called major capital projects. So that could be anything in excess of a million dollars. We do have um, other units in the campus. The, that have different levels of delegation. Our facilities management group has about $3 million delegation. The health system has about 10. Housing and hospitality has 3 million. Asset management has about a million. So all of these, you know, we work very collaboratively. Um, we um, also are our own jurisdiction, but for, as I mentioned, the acute care hospital. So we have our own building department. We have our own inspectors. Um, and we facilitate um, all these projects, a million dollars and above, from conception to project closeout. What, just to give you a sense too, so how do we, how do we strategize? How do we develop the plan? Well, we are bound by um, a long range development plan. And our plan actually was the, 
was developed in 2002. And we've been tearing off of that and, and updating and amending that um, up to today. We are in the process right now of developing um, a major um, uh, update to the original long range development plan and that's going to be proceeding in the next uh, one to two years. We're also um, bound by what um, the University of California uh, calls its um, six year capital financial plan. So um, in, in uh, coordination with um, campus leadership, there's also the campus space um, oversight committee. Um, and there's a lot of um, consultation with the different schools and then also identifying priorities for the campus um, to develop a, a capital plan um, that, again, is updated every year. And um, it, it basically spans about six years. So right now, um, the campus, the capital need uh, with funding um, over the six years is about $1.5 billion. One thing I didn't list here is we also track capital need without funding. And that number is much higher. It's, it's over $7 billion that we're tracking. Um, and um, we are continually looking to uh, you know, find potential, you know, um, everything from donors to state funding to grants to help facilitate, you know, um, achieving those projects and, and being able to fund those. Uh, health system has a separate report um, for the six years. Currently, there's about $2.4 billion. Again, any major capital project over $10 million, uh, are uh, capital programs actually manages, uh, facilitates those projects also. Um, also, as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of consultation and, and with leadership in regards to priorities on campus. Um, as, I, as you see, there's um, the campus have identified about $8.9 billion of capital need and only about approximately $1.5 billion is funded. So there's a continual an opportunity to try and uh, identify what is the highest priorities for the university. And again, some of the challenges that we're looking at to um, uh, you know, achieve um, uh, goal, goals to achieve is the 2030 capacity plan. So we're looking to see how can we increase enrollment um, and uh, develop the, the campus in a responsible way. As I also I mentioned, seismic is a major priority for the university. You know, since 1990, we've um, invested uh, approximately $3 billion um, and retrofit 80 buildings on campus, over 12.8 million square feet on campus. And we're going through another cycle of, of improvements um, that is over a billion dollars worth of requirement. Um, also addressing, you know, the campus has been on the site since 1929. Uh, so aging buildings is a major um, priority. Also infrastructure improvement on an older campus. And then student housing, one of the biggest achievements we've had in, in recent years is with the completion of the Centennial Olympic um, Daily Heights and Southwest Campus Apartments were the first campus in the um, UC system to allow for a two-year transfer, four-year uh, freshman guarantee for housing. So that has been a, a great achievement in the last few years. As I mentioned, um, you know, there is both priorities uh, for both UC, the University of California, and for uh, UCLA, which has kind of guided us through many years as, as really identifying you know what you know what our priorities are one for the university of california obviously is enrollment demand we need to be consistent with the university university's commitment uh, to student access we also have to be cognizant of you know uh, uh, obsolescence and change in academic and research programs um, 
UCLA itself, I mean, it's, it was a very simple plan. One is seismic mitigation. Two is transform UCLA to a residential and academic community and build a sustainable campus. So just going in a little bit more detail on that, as I mentioned, the seismic plan, you know, we've, we've invested almost $3 billion. Um, we're uh, going through another effort and reevaluating all the buildings. We um, completed the initial reevaluation in 2021, and we're putting together a plan to be compliant um, by 2030 of the, the campus building. Um, also, in regards to sustainability, as I mentioned, the UC is the leader in sustainability. Um, you know, there is the UC policy to be carbon uh, ne carbon neutral by 2025, and that's shifted a little bit. It was initially to be net neutral. Now we're being um, looking at actually being uh, carbon neutral without requirements of well, 2025 would be net neutral, and there's now a new requirement for 2045 to be actually carbon neutral without the use of carbon credits. So there's a lot of activity related to um, sustainability. We're looking at a wastewater treatment plant on campus. We're looking at on-site on solar arrays on campus. With the buildings itself, we've been very effective in the last several years. Since 2009, we have 63 lead registered uh, projects, 18 of which are plat uh, lead platinum, which is the highest level that can be achieved. Also, as many of you know, our researchers are, are very in intimately involved with the um, sustainable LA Grand Challenge, and then also um, the LA County Climate uh, Vulnerability Assessment that um, you know we're, we're very much um, involved with the Southern California region and achieving sustainability goals. Just to give you a, um, an idea of some of the recent projects, um, this is Centennial Olympic um, halls, um, 1,700 beds between the both of them. Um, we just completed this in late 2021. Um, also, the Gailey Heights, whoops, the Gailey Heights which um, is a 1,500-bed, 17-story um, tower um, right at the edge of Salt the old uh, university extension site. The southwest uh, campus apartments, 2,200 beds, um, which was completed um, last year. Um, and, and again, it's this, all these three projects actually contributed to allowing for the two-year transfer, four-year freshman guarantee of housing. Other projects that we have been working on, um, oops. So uh, the old Franz uh, Tower, um, we started this project. And again, some of the challenges in regards to funding, um, this started as a seismic mitigation project. And then we um, used some deferred maintenance funding that was available from the state. and developed a plan to uh, very um, respectfully update. This is a 1967 Paul Williams um, uh, uh, building, which is um, you know, very well noted um, African-American architect in Los Angeles, uh, that we um, developed a, both the seismic mitigation infrastructure improvement and then because of you know discussions with potential donors, um, uh, this is now called Trisker Hall, and the donation allowed for additional program improvement within the building. In addition, this project just won a National American Institute of Architects award for uh, the historic modernization of this of this building. Also, another Paul Williams building. Um, this was in 1959, the Botany Building. Again, the, the building was really at the end of its, its um, life, uh, but we were able to go in, seismically improve it, replace all the infrastructure, and then provide uh, basically state-of-the-art labs uh, within the facility. Again, a beautiful location uh, right at the edge of the Botanical Garden. And again, this now has another 50-year life. Um, 
uh, going forward. Um, we also just finished this year uh, the Meyer and A. Luskin uh, School of Public Affairs. This was a seismic mitigation project. Um, again, using a lot of the funding, state funding, um, we have been using specifically for seismic mitigation on campus. And, and we've been um, doing that again since, since 1990. Um, also, again, extending and renewing life in, in ex, uh, existing um, structures. So the former uh, faculty center, now it's, it's the faculty club. We did a uh, seismic and infrastructure improvement. And again, it's kind of renewed the building, renewed its purpose, and, and it's given it another you know, long uh, extension of, of life to we also um, work, you know, um, the, the Occidental building was, was acquired by the campus and in affiliation um, or association with the Hammer Museum. Uh, the Hammer basically expanded their, uh, of their galleries uh, on the first and <clears throat> second floor of this, of the building, and then they actually occupy up to floor six. Then the university actually occupies um, uh, through six through 16. So again, a lot of opportunities, a lot of different uh, cultural you know, projects that we're developing. Um, and again, this is such a great project because of its location right across the street from the metro station. Another um, cultural uh, complex, we work with the uh, theater, film, and television to this was a, an acquisition of the old Crest Theater, um, historic building that we um, worked and through the uh, donation, through a, a donor, uh, Susan Nimoy, we were able to develop this project um, in a, basically a black box theater. Um, this is gonna be opening in the fall. Also, again, repurposing, you can start seeing a theme because we're, we are repurposing and renewing a lot of our existing uh, buildings, again, for sustainability reasons, as well as, you know, just um, looking at, you know, extending the life of, of these facilities. But uh, this, this is 700 Westwood Plaza. Uh, this is re repurposed uh, into um, a simulation lab building for the School of Medicine. Um, this is just going to be opening and it should be actually completed by the end of this month. And then um, Labor Center, this was through a state grant. Um, we were able to take a building that uh, the Labor, uh, UCLA Labor Center had occupied um, as a tenant in this building. The university was able to, to acquire uh, the property and through a state grant. Um, this is being seismically uh, retrofit as well as uh, infrastructure improvement uh, to provide um, a new home, a uh, permanent home for, for the uh, James Lawson Junior Workers Justice Center. And again, um, repurposing buildings. This um, is on uh, Olympic and um, San Vicente at Fairfax. This is um, the old Midway hospital or, or more recently the Olympia Hospital, which the, the uh, health system purchased um, in 2020. And um, the, the mid-century 60s acute care hospital was being converted to a neuropsychiatric hospital. Um, this project is just starting construction and it should be completed in 2026. Um, we're also, again, the infrastructure on the campus, we're, we're developing a, a plan in conjunction with the health system and the campus. Um, we're looking at you know, decarbonization, we're doing a decarbonization study to determine um, how long we can maintain the cogen because uh, there's new state legislation that requires cogeneration plans to be decommissioned by 2045. So we've started a major decarbonization study and utility study on campus to determine kind of what the next steps were, are to both um, facilitate a, a central utility plant 
for the hospital as well as for the clinics. Also, uh, again, getting into strategic acquisitions, uh, the Boulevard Apartments were acquired just uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, this was a, a, another acquisition in conjunction with the health system to provide um, resident housing and then uh, uh, graduate housing for um, both the health system for the medical school as well as the campus. Um, this is on Santa Monica Boulevard, the West End of West, in West Los Angeles. And as um, Steve mentioned, uh, one of um, the recent acquisitions was the Ranch of Palos Verdes. In Ranch of Palos Verdes was the old Marymount California University campus. Um, this is right now in the process, and Steve can talk a little bit more about this, but um, very exciting time to create both the academic plan and then a facilities master plan going forward for this campus. So there's two sites. One, the main campus is in uh, Ranch of Los Verdes. There's a, a residential uh, campus, which is in uh, San Pedro. And then, our most recent acquisition, just a few weeks ago, um, the Trust Building in downtown Los Angeles. So it's very exciting. Um, this is going to be initially a uh, home for University Extension. Um, this is less than two blocks away from the Metro uh, Station, which will ultimately be the Metro Purple Line, which will have a direct connection back to, uh, you know, to the main campus in West. And then talking about the Purple Line, again, we've been working for the last decade uh, with uh, LA Metro and developing the, uh, uh, the Purple Line portal at Westwood at Gailey, the Wilshire and Gailey. Um, you can see in the lower right, you know, the tunnels are actually completed. Um, so now they're just working on the portals, uh, above surface structures, as well as uh, getting um, completed the, the, the trains and the installation. Uh, we're also working with LA Metro on this public corridor. Um, that plan is the initial phase to be completed in 2034. And then finally, the um, LA Olympic Village, which in 2028, we will be the Athens Village. Um, and we've been coordinating, again, with um, LA 2028, which was previously LA 2024, um, but we've been working with them closely the last, probably the last decade. Yeah. So that's it. That's it. That that was quite a, a tutorial, Peter. Uh, I, I I knew you were busy, but now I really get a, a better sense of how busy you really are. Wow, uh, you know, and and. This was like a whole quarter. You could do this in whole quarter, and we you just jam packed it into a single presentation. So for everyone who who's on and got to learn, uh, like I, I, both the history and also what's coming up, and some of the stuff I've learned even very recently as well. And and so yeah, as you were talking about the original sites for the 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 campus, you know. Klaus Verdi's being one of them, the Beverly location, and then Pasadena. So we've kind of come full circle over the last century. And down to Rose Bowl. And, and down to and with the, the UCLA South Bay. So I'm, I'm throwing it out there so everyone knows that you'll you'll start to see more announcements, more branding around UCLA South Bay, which is the Rancho Palos Verdes acquisition, which was formerly Marymount California University. So I'm going to start there with a couple of questions. I have a couple of questions in the chat as well. And for those who are on, if you have any any questions, specific questions, please email Joseph. That his email is in, and he just posted it in the chat because he's right on top of it. So my question is: is so we we acquired the Palos, Rancho Palos Verdes campus. We have now the downtown campus, but. You know, there's a lot of work to do to get them ready for you know, really occupancy or instruction or research. And I know kind of the answer to this, but I'm going to throw it to you. Uh, what is capital programs, mission, vision, responsibilities to help get these, these new locations ready for occupancy and use? So 
so once um, the acquisition takes place and then there was an academic task force that was created for I'll give an example the South Bay campus when when that has been defined um, we are always in the background we are doing some infrastructure surveys um, even in the due diligence as part of the acquisition we start to identify again the, the seismic you know rating of each of these buildings what type of mitigation strategies you know what can be used and and the priorities of kind of the i want to say the infrastructure master plan and then taking the academic plan we would then start developing a uh, basically a master plan or facilities master plan that would basically um, tailor to supporting the academic plan and then prioritize it over multiple years in regards to an implementation plan right yeah great yes yeah, so, so lots, lots of work ahead of us uh, <laughs> and, and you know we talked to you talked some about sustainability we talked a fair amount about sustainability and i know for the south bay campus we're really interested in finding a way to make that a fully sustainable campus can you talk about just some of the ideas of being able to do that yeah, sure. Um, again, we, we look at this as a great opportunity because, um, you know, obviously the the area around uh, Rancho Palos Verdes, um, we were looking initially at on-site solar. Um, we're looking at, you know, again, electrifying a lot of the, you know, um, older infrastructure um, that would allow it to be more sustainable. And then also, you know, looking at any type of transportation plans um, and then you know any type of uh, renovation we would do be would be again with now for the University of California um, uh, policy which is their energy policy which is that we have to actually have be above 20 20 percent above title 24 which is the state energy policy so we have very high standards in regards to um, you know, energy conservation, water conservation. Um, so again, it's, it's going to be a great laboratory down there to uh, apply yeah. some of the research we've been using. We've been uh, looking at it indirectly. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll definitely do a, a lot of business together here. Uh, switching gears slightly to, and again, you, you talked about it some, but I'd love to just hear more. And for the alumni in the in the webinar here. So in LA 28, Olympics will be in LA again. It the UCLA residential halls will be the Olympic Village for the athletes. Very exciting. So UCLA is playing a very prominent part. 28 seems like a far, far time away, but it's not as really right around the corner in terms of all the prep and, and the effort. Can you talk some about what the Olympic Village will look like? What do we need to do to prepare for that? Um, any any additional kind of teeth or color you can add to that? Sure. So um, we've been working with the Olympic, and again, just going back in history, um, LA um, actually had initially uh, had a bid in for the 24 games. Um, when the announcement was made, you know, Paris, and again, it makes sense, it, it would be the centennial for Paris in 2024. You know, 100 years since they hosted the last Olympics. So LA was given, you know, 2028. Um, in working with uh, the committee and the LA 2028 committee, we've identified what's called the security zone. So that would basically um, include the Northwest campus housing. Um, it, it comes down um, around kind of just I think the LA Tennis Center is excluded with intramural fields, the uh, North Athletic Field or Annenberg uh, Stadium is included. Um, it goes around Wooden and um, Poly Pavilion is also going to be included in, in that zone. So um, that will be the secure zone. We are now working with LA 2020 to come up with their uh, transportation plan. They initially thought they would have a consolidated uh, transit hub uh, that would actually uh, be on the, the intramural field and take up some of the Annenberg Stadium. But after years of consultation with them, they identified that they're gonna do a decentralized plan. So we're working with them now 
to include um, basically a, a um, transit plan that would allow for some staging down on Lot 36. There'll be drop-offs um, right at the Westwood Terminus, right in front of Luskin. There will be some potentially a welcome center that would uh, possibly be in the old Ackerman loading dock area, which is, um, you know, would be a, a perfect location for them to, um, you know, to basically access the site. And, and again, it would be right across from the alumni center. So. Great, great. So alumni will have first access, at, at easy access to it. There's a few questions in, that have been sent as for the chat. We probably won't get to all of them given, given the time we have, but we'll try to get to it. And some of these are getting into very specific things. I'm just going to read it. The entrance to UCLA from Westwood via Westwood Boulevard is quite bland and lacks any distinctiveness. Are there any plans to enhance the entry to UCLA? Um, yes. <laughs> Okay. So then just to answer, so um, and I'll go back in time. The the western edge of the um, of that area was actually um, redeveloped in the 1990s. The university we just completed last year a, a campus master landscape plan, and the gateways to the campus are included in that. So yes, there is a plan. <laughs> Any timeline that you can share here? It's too preliminary. Feel free not to answer. I don't want to commit you to anything. But yeah, too too preliminary. It's again, it's one of these um, funding not identified projects. Okay. Yeah, and and there's plenty of stuff to do going around. So, yeah. but good to know. So and the question's been answered and and it's in the works. Yeah. Another another question. I'm just going to read it again. To what extent, if any, has there been pressure? to develop the seven acre UCLA Mildred Mathias Botanical Garden site? Is it securely a garden for many years to come or is it under pressure for development? Oh, no, no, there is, that, that will never be developed. Okay. Period. Yeah. Great, that, it sounds a lot like Central Park in New York where it's it's protected, it will, will always be that. When, when UCLA opened in 1929, that was one of the, um, areas that were originally developed, the botanical garden is that old. Plus, we were just investing. You know, we've invested in the botany building. We actually created La Crete's Pavilion, a new entry. And then there is actually um, there's uh, the, the stream improvements that are happening now. So that that will never be developed. OK. Well, I'm not going to be able to get to the rest of the questions in the chat here, but I, I wanted to give you an opportunity for some closing thoughts. Uh, how can alumni stay up, uh, up to date on what's happening? I know you gave the website. Any, any, anything else that we can do and, and any other closing thoughts before I hand it back to Joseph? You know, I, again, as I think what, what's great about, you know, UCLA and alumni, uh, you know, you all are very much engaged. And, and again, I think our strategic communications folks and others, they do a great job of highlighting all of the different activities are, that are occurring on campus. Again, I, I encourage people, you know, if they are interested in detail, go to our six year plan, um, go to um, looking at um, some of the, the documents that are on our capital programs website. It's a, the, you know, the campus um, physical framework, there's a lot of documents. And then what's very exciting, and again, this is uh, for, for its alumni, we, as I mentioned, we're just starting our new long range development plan. So in the next few years, it's gonna be, it's gonna be very exciting because this plan is gonna incorporate a lot of the, uh, you know, future state in regards to the purple line being activated, you know, as I mentioned, now we have, we're, we are considered a residential campus. Um, and, you know, again, it's, I always, you know, and I think there is a term, I mean, UCLA is under construction like always. And, and it's very true. I've, you know, I've been here over 16 years now and it, and it's just renewing itself and it just keeps getting better. Right. No, absolutely. And, you know, my, some of my closing thoughts is that as a double Bruin myself, as an employee of the Regents at UCLA, like I'm more excited now about what's happening on this campus that we are being proactive. We're building the infrastructure 
to you know maintain our number one public university ranking, but also you know, continue to serve our students and our, our faculty and, and staff. So it's very, very exciting. Thank you, Peter, thank you for everything you do. I know you're probably an unsung hero for, for many. Uh, for those who have been on this webinar, hopefully they understand who you are as, as the campus architect, what Capital Programs does, and is excited for everything that's that's happening, that has happened and will happen. It's a, it's a great place. And I just feel very uh, privileged to be you know, a steward of the campus. We, we, we are lucky to have you. Yes, um, I want to echo what Steve said, Peter. Um, really exciting stuff to come and, and thank you for you know the, the history lesson. Um, I thought that that was, that was pretty awesome. I, I've seen some of these photos in, in books and whatnot, but it was really nice to get even a deeper insight into how UCLA you know, came to what it is today. So Thank you for being here. And Steve, thank you for leading today's conversation with Peter. Um, we really appreciate both of you taking time out of your evening. And to those of you who tuned in uh, this evening, um, hope you enjoyed the conversation. And uh, we wish you a good night and a wonderful rest of your week. Go Bruins. Go Bruins. Thank you. Thank you.